So if you are joining us from home tonight, welcome to Peoples and welcome to the season of Lent. Lent is the six and a half weeks leading up to Easter when we join Jesus in the wilderness and walk beside him as he gets closer and closer to the cross. The themes of Lent can be unpleasant or even uncomfortable for some people since while we all know that we came from dust and will someday return to dust, most people don't enjoy thinking about their own mortality. But before Jesus can be resurrected on Easter morning, he has to die first. Before we can join the great cloud of witnesses and see all of the saints, we too have to die. Before new plants can come up from the ground, something has to die to nourish the soil. And before change can come, something has to end. It's all part of a cycle of birth and death and rebirth and eternity that links us back to the moment when God first knelt down in the soil of the new earth to shape humankind out of dust. That is the dust that we have come from, and that is the dust that we will return to. We don't know how long any of us will have between our time of creation to our time of return. The question that we should ask ourselves isn't, how much time will I have, but what will I do with the time that I have? There is all the fullness of the world in the possible answers to that question, and there is no better time than Lent to ask them. How do you want to live? How do you want to be remembered? What legacy do you want to leave behind? In the season of Lent, sometimes it feels like Jesus is far away, doing things we don't always understand, saying things that we don't always like, experiencing things that we can't always empathize with. That's okay. Even his closest friends were constantly bewildered by Jesus. But even so, they stayed with him, almost to the end. And that is what Lent is. When Jesus feels far away, remember that our calling in life is to follow him. So in this season, I invite you to come closer, to be willing to experience all the fullness of this season. The more closely we follow Jesus, the more light that we can see to guide our way home. So if you are joining us from home this evening, I invite you to light a candle of your own and make yourself comfortable and focus on our time together, setting aside phones or distractions unless you're watching this service on your phone, in which case don't set it aside. Technology is weird. Um, anyway, be fully present. I also encourage you to find a way to mark your forehead with us, whether that's uh, with ashes, eyeshadow, olive oil, flour, dirt, even water, or whatever else you have on hand, or just a way to get your hands dirty. Singeing one end of a cork from like a wine bottle is particularly effective if you happen to have one of those nearby. So join us tonight in reading, praying, listening, reflecting, and singing. Join us with all that you have, because Jesus loves and accepts you for all that you are. Please join with me in our opening prayer from Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. Wash me through and through, and cleanse me from my sin. We know that you desire us to live with truth, so please teach us wisdom. Please don't give up on us, but restore us to the joy of your salvation. Restore us so that we can lead others to you. Restore us so that we can declare your praise. Restore us, forgive us. Fill us with your grace, and we will worship you with all that we are. Amen.
Here's tonight's call to confession. Lent can sometimes get a negative reputation. It's viewed as the season in our faith. When we give things up, we prepare for the worst. However, I cannot help imagine that God wants more for us than just six weeks of discipline or six weeks without chocolate. I cannot help but imagine that God wants life for us so expansive that faith, joy, and hope flow over the edges. So let us confess, not because we have to suffer our way through Lent, but because the truth moves us one step closer to that expansive faith. Let us pray. Please join me in unison prayer of confession, followed by a time for silent personal confession. Let us pray. Holy God, I confess. I don't return to you fully. I share with you the pieces of my life that are convenient. I put on different hats in different rooms. I forget that I am called, invited, and loved with all that I am, including my mess, my beauty, my faith, and my doubt. Forgive me, and give me a heart that longs to return. Friend, God sees you. God hears you. God loves you. You are forgiven and claimed with all that you are. Rest in that good news. Thanks be to God. Amen. Holy God, we confess we don't return to you fully. We share with you the pieces of our lives that are convenient. We put on different hats in different rooms. We forget that we are called, invited, and loved with all that we are, including our mess, our beauty, our faith, and our doubt. Forgive us and give us our hearts that long re to return. Friends, God sees you. God hears you. God loves you. You are forgiven and claimed with all that you are. Rest in that good news. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Please pray with me. Loving Creator, we are here telling stories of dust. We are here trying to shake the dust out of our ears so that we might hear you clearly. We are here hoping that showing up is the first step in returning to you. Scoop us up in your embrace and carry us to a place of truth. Clear the smog that makes it hard to see. Clear the dust that makes it hard to hear. We are at the edge of our seats. We are listening for you. Amen. Our first gospel reading comes tonight from Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. Jesus said, Beware of practicing your piety before others in order to be seen by them, for then you have no reward from your Father in heaven. So whenever you give alms, do not sound a trumpet before you, as as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, 
so that they may be praised by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you give alms, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your alms may be done in secret, and your Father, who sees in secret, will reward you. And whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and in the street corners, so that they may not be seen by others. Truly I tell you that they have received their reward. But whenever you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. So in the commentaries that come with our new worship series for the season called Full to the Brim, the Reverend Ashley Dattar Burt writes, In Matthew 6, we are given instructions on how we should practice our faith. Specifically, we shouldn't be too showy, too flashy, or doing things just to attract the attention of others. The truth is, though, sometimes we are going to attract the attention of others, and sometimes we aren't. Some of us are loud, bold people who live loud, bold lives, and our faith comes out the same way. Some of us are quiet and still, seeking quiet and still lives with quiet and still faith. Most of us are both and neither and in between. We're boisterous and meek and terrified and joyous and nervous and so many things. These are all beautiful things not because others can see them, but because they make us who we are. We, just as we are, are enough. That is enough for our existence, and that is enough for God. It doesn't matter what others think. What matters is that we are authentic, that our faith is authentic, and that we are ourselves before God. Your journey with God is not a performance. It's intimate and rewarding in ways that aren't necessarily measured. We are invited to pursue the wealth of the inner life, which reframes the paradigm that God is outward or beyond us. Instead, we might find God by turning inward, recognizing that God is connected to everything. And God wants you authentically and vulnerably 
You are enough. Come as you are with all that you are. Our second reading tonight comes to us from the prophet Joel, chapter 2, verses 2 through 12 through 17. Hear now the word of the Lord. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Sound the alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. It is near. A day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Like blackness spread upon the mountains, a great and powerful army comes. Their like has never been from of old, nor will be again after them in ages to come. Yet even now, says the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. Rend your hearts and not your clothing. Return to the Lord your God, who is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and relents from punishing. Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the aged, gather the children, even infants at the breast. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her canopy. Between the vestibule and the altar, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep. Let them say, spare your people, O Lord, and do not make your heritage a mockery, a byword among the nations. Why should it be said among the peoples, where is their God? This is the word of the Lord. When prophets like Joel speak in the Bible, they aren't predicting the future in the weird, mystical way that we think of oracles and horoscopes and fortune tellers. Instead, prophets call out what the repercussions may well be if we don't change our ways and live the lives that God longs for us to live. Joel and many other prophets as well speak of the day of the Lord that is drawing near. But the day of the Lord is no doomsday or end of times. The day of the Lord is a day when the Lord steps into our lives and listens to us. But our God loves us actively, intimately, and daily. So every day is the day of the Lord. Joel assures us that we don't have to wait before we can come together and worship God or before we can lift up our prayers, or before we can start to change our ways. Today is the day of the Lord, and tomorrow will be too. God listens, God acts, God speaks, even now. In an Ash Wednesday sermon that she wrote a few years ago, Episcopal priest and delightful human being and author Nadia Bowles Weber wrote that a reminder of our death could only be a threat or an insult if we believed it to be the last word. But death is not the last word, and it is not the final end, because God's symphony of grace will ring out long past the final breath of the universe. The same is true, Nadia says, about confessing our sins. I've said it before, but it bears repeating. People who think I'm some crazy liberal are always so shocked about how much I love to talk about sin. I think liberals tend to think admitting we are sinful is the same as having low self-esteem. And then conservatives equate sin with immorality. So one end of the church tells us that sin is an antiquated notion that only makes us feel bad about ourselves and so we should avoid mentioning it all. Well, the other end of the church tells us that sin is the same as immorality and totally avoidable if you can just be a good, squeaky clean Christian. Confession isn't an end, it's a beginning. If we never admit or confess our sins even to ourselves, then there is no place to go towards repentance or change or doing right by anyone whom we may have hurt. To be hesitant to confess, even to ourselves, is to admit that we aren't sure if God is big enough or gracious enough 
to help us wash our souls clean. To refuse to confess, even to ourselves, is to declare that we don't need God. But God is big enough, and God's grace is big enough, and we very much need God. The Reverend Dr. M. Craig Barnes, president of Princeton Theological Seminary, where I attended, once said that there can be a danger in calling out from the pulpit for people to confess their sins. He gave the absolutely wonderful illustration of a congregation full of golden retrievers hanging their heads and saying, we know, we're such bad dogs, we're sorry, we know. Apparently he used to have golden retrievers, which just makes this illustration even better. But the point isn't to feel bad about ourselves, or at least the point isn't to stop at feeling bad about ourselves. The point is to know that we are empowered by the incredible, abundant, overflowing grace of God to move beyond that guilt into new life. Death is not the last word. Confession is not the last word. Guilt is not the last word. God's symphony of grace will ring out long past the final breath of the universe. And so the prophet Joel invites us together to fast and cry and pray and blow trumpets and help each other to learn and grow and change because God will welcome us no matter how dusty or broken or lost we may feel even when our mascara is running down our faces from joy or sorrow or just allergies, even when we don't know what to say, even when we're too scared to come alone, even when we know we've messed up, even when we're old, even when we're young, as much as God longs to guide us towards kindness and justice and growth and change, God loves us already on this day of the Lord, with all that we are. The prophet Joel asks, why should it be said among the peoples, where is their God? Why indeed should that be said, where is our God? Because God is right here. Today is the day of the Lord, and God is in our midst. Please pray with me. When I say, in the, all the fullness of your grace, you might respond, Lord, have mercy, Christ, have mercy. In all the fullness of your grace, Lord, have mercy, Christ, have mercy. Loving Lord, at the beginning of this Lenten season, we are met with the challenge of handing over every bit of our lives that do not come from you to rid ourselves of what clutters our lives and all that distracts us from the simple truth of your love for us. 
in all the fullness of your grace. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Your prophets have called us to change the way we worship, to make internal sacrifices instead of external ones, to seek justice and love kindness and walk humbly with you each and every one of our days. In all the fullness of your grace, Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. If we don't give anything up for Lent, then let us at least give up this, that we might live ceasing living in ways that disconnect us from you, for every one of our steps is like a circle around your temple. Perhaps this Lent, we can give up our way and give ourselves to you for your way for us. In all the fullness of your grace, Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. So lead us and guide us on this Lenten way. May we walk with Jesus toward the hill just outside of Jerusalem. May we, like him, take up our cross and follow, spending each moment of our lives living responsively to you, just as Christ himself did, for that is the faithful way. In all the fullness of your grace, Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Marked by your abundant grace that fills us to the brim and makes us all that we are, we join our voices to pray the prayer you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So you may be familiar with the phrase of wearing one's heart on one's sleeve. Tonight, I invite you instead to wear your soul on your forehead. Thirty-some years ago, when I was baptized, Father Edwards dipped his hand into water and touched it to my forehead in the shape of a cross, promising all gathered there that God would love me unconditionally until the end of time. Someday, I will die, and my ashes will be laid to rest in an old cemetery beside the sea, next to the ashes of the parents who raised me. And my friends will be asked to toss handfuls of dirt and wildflower seeds onto our plot. But tonight, those two moments come together, the cross and the ashes, the beginning and the end. And in the in-between space that is the season of Lent, we are invited to decide how we want to live out the rest of our days, Will we follow Jesus and choose the way of love? Will we live out our faith and wear it openly? Will we seek out the lost and the lonely, the tired and the hungry, the cold and the thirsty, the brokenhearted and afraid, all those in need of compassion? Are you in need of the reminder of God's presence in your life? These ashes are for you not as a sacrament or a commitment or a testimony, but as an invitation. An invitation to join us as we walk together towards the cross and follow Jesus. An invitation to join us on Sunday mornings for worship, or Tuesday nights for a Lenten Bible study, or Wednesday nights for a special series of evening prayer with art and poetry. An invitation to question who you say that Jesus is, an invitation to open your heart to something new, an invitation to remember that you are full to the brim with the love of God, so much so that sometimes it spills out onto your forehead. So I invite you to come forward to receive ashes. If you aren't comfortable with me touching your forehead, I can touch the back of your hand instead, 
or you can take a piece of cloth that I uh, smudged with ashes to wipe on your own forehead. If you aren't able to come forward, stay in your seat and I will come to you. If you could all be so kind as to wear your masks, I would very much appreciate that personally. Remember that you are dust and will return to dust. But remember also that God's own hands shaped you out of that dust in God's own image. And remember that that dust came from the stars and that your soul glitters with God's love and grace and stardust. God made something beautiful when you were created and God will love you long after you have returned to the dust. Please join with me in reading our affirmation of faith. We believe in an expansive love that healed the sick, welcomed the children, and saw this love as it could be. We believe that that expansive love runs over the edges of our lives, smoothing our rough places and pulling us home. We call that expanse of love Yahweh and Mother God, Jesus and Divine Creator. Thanks be to God for a love like that. Amen. So as we sit tonight and then step out into the new season of Lent, 
I wanted to share with you a poem by the Reverend Sarah R. Speed entitled, On My Way. You said, return to me. So here I am, skin and bones held together with memories and a little bit of duct tape. I am bringing the worst of me. Consider yourself warned. The furrowed brow, the achy back, the slew of judgments, a pocket full of assumptions, the track of negativity that runs laps in my head. I am bringing it all because you said, return to me. Edits not required. So return, I will. And not all of it will be bad. Some of it will be lovely. I will bring a wagon full of nostalgia, a melody that won't let me go, a million stories that start with the words, oh, it was beautiful. I will bring a mended heart, a glass half full, two lungs out of breath from dancing too long, and dreams that taste like honey. I will bring my whole messy human self because I know, I just know, deep in my bones, that you are already running to meet me. There are no cuts on this team. You said you'd take it all. So here I come, me and all my humanity. We are on our way. So friends, as you leave this place, may you be awestruck by the beauty of this world. May you laugh and may it be contagious. May you overflow with love for those around you. May you be effusive with hope and quick to point out joy. And in all of your living and breathing and being, may you find yourself full to the brim with God's Holy Spirit and may it change your life in the name of the lover, the beloved, and love itself, go in peace, full to the brim. <laughs>